We begin today's special broadcast remembering the life and legacy of the legendary anti-war priest, Father Dan Berrigan. He died April 30th, just short of his 95th birthday. Berrigan was a poet, a pacifist, an educator, a social activist, a playwright, and a lifelong resistor against what he called American military imperialism. Along with his late brother, Phil Berrigan, Father Dan played an instrumental role in inspiring the anti-war and anti-draft movement during the 1960s, as well as the movement against nuclear weapons in the early 70s. He became the first Catholic priest to land on the FBI's most wanted list. Georgetown University theology professor Chester Gillis once said of Father Berrigan, quote, if you were to identify Catholic prophets in the 20th century, he'd be right there with Dorothy Day or Thomas Merton. In early 1968, Father Dan Berrigan made international headlines when he traveled to North Vietnam with historian Howard Zinn to bring home three U.S. prisoners of war. In the documentary Holy Outlaw, Father Dan recalled spending time in Vietnamese shelters while being bombed by U.S. jets. So we were in this shelter and very unexpectedly came on three children who were crouching in there too, against all expectations. And one of the uh, elder children feeding rice to one of the younger ones. And I wrote this little verse within a couple of days and tried to read it later at our trial. Dan to the Berrigan. great uh, anger and discomfiture of the judge. But it seemed to sum up for me everything that uh, Catonsville was about in one image, one reality. It's called Children in the Shelter. Imagine three of them as though survival were a rat's word and a rat's death waited there at the end. And I must have in the century's boneyard heft of flesh and bone in my arms. I picked up the littlest, a boy, his face breaded with rice, his sister calmly feeding him as we climbed down. In my arms fathered in a moment's grace the Messiah of all my tears. I bore, reborn, a Hiroshima child from hell. On May 17, 1968, Father Dan Berrigan, his brother Phil Berrigan, and seven others took 378 draft files from the draft board in Catonsville, Maryland. Then, in the parking lot of the draft board office, the activists set the draft records on fire, using homemade napalm to protest the Vietnam War. They became known as the Catonsville Nine. The act of civil disobedience was chronicled in the 2013 documentary Hit and Stay, A History of Faith and Resistance. This begins with Dan Berrigan. We make our prayer in the name of that God whose name is peace and decency and unity and love. We unite with taking our matches, approaching with fire. We're all part of this. While people throughout the world, and especially Vietnam now, are suffering from napalm, and these files are also napalm to show that the, these lives can fall in the same way that we get together. Amen. Napalm, which was made from information and from a formula in the United States Special Forces Handbook published by the School of Special Warfare of the United States. We all had a hand in making the napalm. It was used here today. Uh, napalm is a very old weapon. It goes back to the, the Byzantines. But it really came to public attention during the war in Vietnam. And there were pictures of napalm people. So that was the kind of quintessential symbol of the war. We were burning babies, literally, in Vietnam. So that's why we wanted to come up with something symbolic and also something that would really destroy the files. Our church has failed to act officially, and we feel that, as individuals, we're going to have to speak out in the name of Catholicism and Christianity. And we hope by our action to inspire other people who have Christian principles or a, a faith similar to Christianity will act accordingly to, to stop the terrible destruction that America is wrecking on the whole world. We regret very much, uh, I think, all of us, the inconvenience and even the suffering that we brought to these clerks here. We sincerely hope we didn't injure we have chosen to be powerless criminals in a time of criminal power. We have chosen to be branded as peace criminals 
by war criminals. Father Dan Berrigan and other members of the Catonsville Nine were arrested on the spot. Dan Berrigan wrote, quote, Our apologies, good friends, for the fracture of good order, the burning of paper instead of children, unquote. The draft board raid invigorated the anti-war movement by inspiring over a hundred similar acts of protest. It also shook the foundation of the tradition-bound Catholic Church. Father Dan would eventually serve time, about two years, in a federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut. In 1980, the Berrigan brothers and six others began the Plowshares Movement when they broke into the General Electric nuclear missile facility in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. The activists hammered nuclear warhead nose cones and poured blood onto documents and files. They were arrested and charged with over 10 different felony and misdemeanor counts. They became known as the Plowshares Eight. I want to turn to a clip from the film In the King of Prussia. This scene features Dan Berrigan reciting what he told the judge and jury during the trial. You've heard about hammers and blood in this room. These are the hammers of hell. These are the hammers that will break the world to bits. These are the hammers that clang the end of the world. The judge knows it. The prosecutor knows it. We've seen people walk away from these things. We've seen them disclaim them. We've seen them say they're not responsible for them. We've seen all sorts of language circling them, like a dance of death. They are murdered. He knows it. He knows it. You must know it. We have been trying, we eight, to take responsibility for these things, to call them by their right name, which is murder, death, genocide, the end of the world. Their proper use is known to the judge and the prosecutor and to you. We would like you to know the name of our crime. We would like to assume responsibility for a world, for children, for the future. And if that is a crime, then it is quite clear that we belong in their jails. Where they belong is something else. But in the name of all the eight, I would like to leave with you friends and jurors, that great and noble word, which is our crime, responsibility. That's an excerpt from the film In the King of Prussia, the film directed by Emile D'Antonio. We turn now to one of Father Dan Berrigan's last appearances on Democracy Now! It was June 8, 2006, shortly after his 85th birthday. Can you talk about that first decision you made in Catonsville, um, before Catonsville, to do it, um, what you were doing at the time, and how you made the decision? Yeah, I was teaching at Cornell, and Philip came up. He was awaiting sentencing for prior action in 67 in Baltimore, where they poured their blood on draft files in the city. And uh, he came up to Cornell and announced to me very coolly that he and others were going to do it again. I was uh, blown away by the courage, uh, the effrontery, really, of my brother in uh, not really just submitting to the prior conviction, but saying, uh, we've got to underscore the first action with another one. And he said, you're invited. So I swallowed hard and uh, said, give me a few days. I want to talk about pros and cons of doing a thing like this. And so when I started meditating and putting down reasons to do it and reasons not to do it, it became quite clear that the option and the invitation were outweighing everything else and that I had to go ahead uh, with them. So I notified him that I was in. And we did it. Now, this was after you'd been to North Vietnam. Right. 
This was uh, May of 68, and I had been in Hanoi in late January, early February of that year. With historian Howard Zinn. Right. Freeing prisoners of war? Yes, we brought home three flyers uh, who had been captured and uh, imprisoned. It was a kind of gesture of peace in the midst of the war by the Vietnamese during the so-called Tet Holiday, which was traditionally a time of reunion uh, of families. And so they wanted these flyers to be reunited with their families. In Catonsville, was this the first time you were breaking the laws of the United States? No, I had been at the Pentagon in 67, in, I think it was in October, and a great number of us were arrested after a warning from McNamara to disperse. And uh, we spent a couple of weeks in jail. It was rather rough. Uh, and we did a fast, and we were in the D.C. jail, which is a very mixed lot. So I had had a little bit of a taste uh, during that prior year. You and your brother, Phil Berrigan, had an unusual relationship with Secretary of Defense McNamara. You actually talked to him, wrote to him, met him? Yes, I met him at a social <clears throat> evening with the Kennedys in about 65. And after this uh, very posh dinner, which was welcoming me home from Latin America, uh, one of the Kennedys announced that they, they would love to have a discussion between the Secretary of War and myself in front of everybody, which we did start. And they asked me to initiate the thing, and I said to the Secretary something about, since you didn't stop the war this morning, I wonder if you do it this evening. So he looked kind of past my left ear and said, well, I'll just say this to Father Berrigan and everybody. Um, Vietnam is like Mississippi. If they won't obey the law, you send the troops in. And he stopped. And the next morning when I returned to New York City, I said to a secretary at a magazine we were publishing, I said, would you please take this down in shorthand because in two weeks I won't believe that I heard what I heard. The secretary said in response to my request to stop the war, quote, Vietnam is like Mississippi. If they won't obey the law, you send the troops in. And this was supposed to be the brightest of the bright, uh, one of the whiz kids. Uh, respected by all in the cabinet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he talks like a sheriff out of Selma, Alabama. Whose law? Won't obey whose law? Well, that was the level at which the war was being fought. So you went to Catonsville. You went into the draft office. Right. We hear about draft card burnings, but this was draft file, file. burnings. You went in with a group of people. Now, some of them, you talked about having been in exile in Latin America, and some of them were there more about treatment of what was going on in the U.S. government in places like Guatemala than Vietnam. Is that right? That's right. Why were you exiled to Latin America? Well, there was a lot of controversy and a very hot scene here in, this, in New York City. Uh, beginning about 67 into 68. And I think the occasion of my being kicked out was the immolation of a young Catholic worker in the city here uh, named Roger Laporte. He went to the UN and burned himself. And uh, of course the young Catholic worker community was devastated by this terrifying event and they wanted to hold a memorial service, and I was invited to officiate. And in the course of it, I cast doubt upon the judgment of the cardinal that this had been suicide. I said, I don't, I don't think we know. I think this could have been some kind of misguided heroism that said, I'm going to give my life rather than take life. And that word, of course, got out 
And uh, there was panic. There was panic in the authorities of the Archdiocese of New York and in my order. And they said, we've got to, we've got, he's got a, he's become a very hot item. We've got to get him out of town. Where were you exiled to? Well, it was a one-way ticket to Latin America. And so I was down there, I think, about five months. And I was in at least 10 countries purportedly reporting back to my uh, editorial people in New York about conditions down there. Uh, it was a wrong move. It generated huge publicity, not just in the Catholic community, but across the country. And uh, they were forced to call me back. So I came back with a stipulation that I go on with my peace work, and they said, okay, okay. And so you certainly did enforce. And from Catonsville, you served how many years in prison for that? Well, I think it was about two years. And then with your brother, Phil, you founded the Plowshares Movement, your first action, 1980, 80. King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Right. Explain what you did at the GE plan. Well, we had had meetings, I recall, all that spring and autumn with people about the production of an entirely new weapon, uh, uh, the Mark 12A, which was really only useful if it initiated a nuclear war. It was a first strike nuclear weapon. And um, was being fabricated in this anonymous plant, huge, huge factory in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. And there had never been an attempt in the history of the anti-nuclear movement, there had never been an attempt to interfere with the production of a new weapon. And with the help of Daniel Ellsberg and other experts, we were able to uh, understand that this was not a Hiroshima-type bomb, it was something totally different. It was opening a new chapter in this uh, chamber of horrors. So we decided we would go in there in September of 70. And we did. September of 80? 80. 80, excuse me. Uh -huh. And what does that mean you did? Well, we didn't know exactly where in that huge factory these weapons were concealed, but we had to trust in Providence that we would come upon the weaponry, which we did in short order. We went in with the workers at the changing of the shift and found there was really no security worth talking about. Uh, very easy entrance. In about three minutes, we were looking at doomsday. The weapon was before us. It was an unarmed warhead about to be shipped to Embro, Texas for its payload. So it was a harmless weapon as of that moment. And uh, we, we cracked the weapon. It was very fragile. Uh, it was made to withstand the heat of reentry into the atmosphere from outer space, so it was like eggshell, really. And we had taken as our motto the great statement of Isaiah 2, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. So we did it, poured our blood around it, and stood in a circle, I think reciting the Lord's Prayer until Armageddon arrived, as we expected. And you were tried? We were tried and convicted in short order and sentenced eventually to three to 10 years. <clears throat> uh, and we were out on appeal for 10 years. The trial was such a farce that the uh, state of Pennsylvania really didn't know what to do with it. And it went on and on and on. And finally in 1990, uh, a retired judge, kind of weary of the whole game, gave us Quote, time served. Father Dan Berrigan, speaking on Democracy Now! in June of 2006, will return to the interview. <laughs>